Our scripture for this morning comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Let us pray together. Now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our Advent journey is nearing its close today. With Christmas Eve only a few short hours away, like the cousins Mary and Elizabeth, we are pregnant with anticipation for the birth of a child who will change the course of history. But even though this is our fourth Sunday to light the Advent candles and sing the familiar carols hearkening the birth of our Savior, we easily miss the waiting in the hustle and bustle of our daily lives. There's nothing like the end of a school semester, a Christmas gift list that never seems to get smaller, and a month filled with engagements to ramp us into warp speed, put blinders over our eyes, and only allow us to come up for air when the last gift is unwrapped and the whole Advent season has passed us by. I wouldn't be surprised if this is the reason why Mary and Elizabeth snuck their way into the lectionary for this last Sunday of Advent. Mary's song, which follows the passage we read, normally accompanies the third Sunday of Advent, or the Joy Sunday. But today we find two women in different stages of life and different stages of pregnancy greeting one another and celebrating the lives that will come through them. However, even Elizabeth, who is further along in her pregnancy than Mary, will not give birth tomorrow. Both women are anticipating days still unknown, months away. Their journeys represent nine months each of waiting, longing, and hoping. So even as we struggle to slow down long enough to appreciate this season of anticipation and longing, Mary and Elizabeth come to us the day before our Advent season comes to a close to call us to slow down, to remember that for them the journey to Bethlehem was long, the road fraught with trials, and the reality of what's to come ever present within them, fluttering and kicking in their wombs. Many of you in this room can identify clearly with Mary and Elizabeth in the endless waiting that accompanies the arrival of a new child. Pregnancy, no, though not the only way one waits for a new child, begins with waiting for two lines to show up on a stick. This, of course, may be accompanied with months or years of waiting for the stars to align, for that child to be, to finally plant itself exactly where it needs to be to grow into a fully formed baby. Then there's the waiting for the appropriate time to be able to tell friends and family, waiting for morning or round-the-clock sickness to end, waiting to see the baby for the first time on an ultrasound, to hear the baby's heartbeat, waiting for a bump to appear or for the first real kick to make the baby's presence 
feel real? The waiting can be excruciating before you even reach the third trimester, let alone the baby's arrival. And here are Mary and Elizabeth, two women who in reality should not be pregnant, one not married and a virgin, and the other beyond childbirthing age. Elizabeth's anticipation for a child spans decades and reached the point of hopelessness. Mary never dreamed of having a child outside of the societal norms presented to her all of her life. And whatever happiness these two women display has to be often met with skepticism from friends and neighbors. But you know geriatric pregnancies often end in difficulties for the mother, right? Well, Mary, I can't believe you are excited about the appalling behavior that led to this child. For all the waiting these two women had already done, they had to wait to greet each other before they could live into the overwhelming joy they both knew inside their hearts. As I hear the story of these two women, I'm reminded of one of my favorite TV shows, Parks and Recreation. On the show, Amy Poehler plays the lovable, if a bit eccentric, Leslie Nope, the deputy parks director of a small town called Pawnee, Indiana. Her energy and dedication to civil service endears her to the small cast of outrageous characters as they work together to improve all the parks in their tiny town. And one episode centers around Leslie's best friend, Anne, who finds out she's pregnant while Leslie is out of town. Anne and her partner, Chris, begin to tell all their colleagues in the parks department their good news, anticipating the excitement they will get to share with all of their friends. And yet no one seems overly thrilled for them. Most of them knew Anne was trying to get pregnant, so they were not surprised by the news. Or they were not in the stage of life where pregnancies and new babies seemed all that exciting to them. The one person who was enthusiastic for Anne and Chris went on and on about the litany of uncomfortable things Anne would experience during her pregnancy. So by the end of the day, Anne and Chris felt they would have been better off keeping the news to themselves. They were so discouraged by their friends' responses and worried that the next eight months would provide a very lonely road for them. Until Leslie got home. The first moment we see of Leslie's arrival home, she has surrounded Anne in a giant bear hug and goes on to say, A thousand years from now, this moment will be remembered because your baby will change the course of history. And Leslie is in complete earnest in her desire to communicate her joy for Anne and Chris. And even if she does go a little overboard, isn't that the kind of thing every expectant parent wants to hear? That they are anticipating a child that will make the world a better place. Can you imagine the kind of comments Mary received when she began telling people that she was pregnant? We already know that Joseph had to be convinced by an angel to stay with his betrothed. But what about the friends and family members who didn't have angels appearing to them in a dream? What kinds of words must they have spoken to Mary? I'm guessing it would have been pretty easy for Mary to lose sight of the wonder of this child that she was carrying. She and Joseph must have been very discouraged that this time, which should be joyful, was met with such hostility and disbelief. But Mary, upon hearing that her elderly cousin Elizabeth is also pregnant, walks to the hillside of Judea in hopes that Elizabeth will at least provide some solidarity in this season of life. And like Leslie Nope, Elizabeth exceeds Mary's expectations. For the baby inside Elizabeth leaps within her 
and Elizabeth cannot contain her joy. She blesses Mary and offers her the encouragement she needs to believe once again in the great works that God is carrying out through her. The interaction between these two women gives Mary the courage she barely felt before to proclaim the words of one of the most highly regarded songs found in Scripture. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the lowliness of his servant with favor. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Mary's song is as subversive as the woman carrying the Christ child in her womb. She speaks of a God who takes our expectations and turns them upside down. And she doesn't speak these words as if God still needs to fulfill the promises he made to her and her people. Mary's words are present tense. Mary who has yet to even feel her baby kick inside her, sings a song of a God who has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Elizabeth specifically blesses Mary for her belief. And it is this belief that causes her to sing to a God who has already fulfilled promises, who has remained faithful throughout all generations. Mary does not need to sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, because she sings of a God who is and will be, even as this Emmanuel grows inside of her. In our own times of waiting, even when we forget what we are waiting for, it is so easy to forget how God is moving in, through, beyond, and before our waiting. We anticipate so much what God will do and how God will change things for us that we forget how God already has. But these two marginalized women who find themselves in very unexpected circumstances, give us the courage to sing the song of a God who loves those on the margins, who feeds those who are hungry, who lifts up the lowly. And it is when, or more likely because, they are together that they both are able to live into the depths of their belief in how God is moving through them. Elizabeth and Mary know one another's stories and encourage each other to hold on to the hope and joy as they learn even more about how God is using them. And their story is our story, too. When we are together, we encourage each other. When we gather in this place, we build each other up. When we know one another intimately, we can share each other's joys and bless one another. And in so doing, we give each other the courage to begin to sing our own song to God, a song of love and hope, like Mary's. Like Mary, we too can remember that even in our waiting, God is moving. 
God has moved, and God will continue to move through us. Yes, Christmas is almost here. Another one of God's promises fulfilled among us. We have much to anticipate. But even after Christmas, we may still find ourselves longing for the Savior we sing about to turn things on their head again. And even in that waiting, we can sing with Mary a song of great love and promise that the God who has been with us through all generations is with us now. The road to Bethlehem is longer than we know, but the God of love walks with us, and that is something worth singing about. Let us pray. Gracious God, who lifts up the lowly, we thank you for filling our hearts with your love. We pray that even in our waiting, we will be reminded of your movement among us. For it is in the name of the one whose mother taught us how to sing that we pray. Amen.